Free your mind now. Be part of People's Pan-African Parliament, the Pan-African Pyramid Debate, with your speaker, Andrew Irumba Katushabe. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard. Welcome to the another edition of the Pan-African Pyramid Show here at Fairway Hotel every Friday from 5 to 8 p.m. And the entrance is absolutely free, always here in Kampala. If you're following us on our various social media platforms, please just know that we are live in Kampala. To be specific, at Fairway Hotel in Kampala. And this debate runs on Fridays from 5 to 8 p.m. And the recorded version runs on NBS Television, our partner sponsor, every Saturday from 4 to 5 p.m. Your speaker is Andrew Irumba Katsaka. And it's always a, a pleasure for me seeing all of you here, physically here at Fairway, and those of you who are following us on our social media platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to remind you that on 31st, of August will be our seventh Pan African Pyramid Global Awards. Free your mind now. Be part of People's Pan African Parliament, the Pan African Pyramid Debate, with your speaker, Andrew Irumba Katushabe. Ladies and gentlemen, African tradition, traditional and judicial systems versus Western commercialized democracy, the so called hybrid democracy. Which way, Africa? I bring this in the context that. Before we were colonized, the former colonizers, they found us organized. We had leadership. We were actually being led by the people in whom we believed. Those people believed in us and we believed in them. There was a system. There was a judicial system. If you committed a crime, there was a leader in your community that would handle your matter. You did need a single coin to go and present your petition for somebody to be punished or for you to get justice. Today, if you have a problem, you first have to look for money, put it aside, look for a lawyer, give him a lot of money, and that is if the other person also does not give him money, give him money, and, and the other person you are going to fight with, in the, so there is also a possibility that they also give him money. So you will be in court, but you think he's fighting for your right, yet actually he's not fighting for your right. So you didn't need any money. You didn't need any amount of education for you to go to any judicial system and say, this neighbor of mine has stolen my gold. This neighbor of mine has taken my land. The very people in the community that you live with were the ones that would sit in this court, not the chief justice of Uganda. He doesn't know, <laughs> justice of Uganda doesn't know where Toro is actually. He doesn't know where Masika is, myself. He doesn't know my immediate neighbors. He doesn't know the demarcation or the boundaries of my land. My neighbor does. My neighbor does. Those chiefs in the communities that were elected by the kings, they knew. And every week or every month they would go and give this petition to the kingdom, to the kingdom head, to the king. Every week there was a report that you're supposed to report to give to the leader. These are the problems from my community. This is what we want you to look at, and he would summon you. If he gave you powers and you could not abdicate, you know, there are some issues that were, were uh, beyond your, 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 uh, your, your powers in the area, in the community. So you'd take those matters to the traditional leader or to the king. Those other small issues, he could allow you to settle them. Those big issues, you petition the king or the traditional leader. That was our judicial system. You didn't need any money. You didn't need any amount of education. You didn't need any lawyer. What is happening today? When somebody takes your land, he's the very person who will advise you to go to court. As you're walking to court, he's passing in the backyard of the court. He's giving the person you have reported to the case, he's giving him money. The moment he gives him money, for you are reporting on Marusu, he will not listen to you. That's number one. If you get an opportunity to be listened to, that case may drag for 20 years. 20 years, a land dispute. By the time the case is, is, is disposed of, the person you took to court has built a, an apartment on the land. You get it? It's actually accruing money from the apartment, paying the judges paying the lawyer. If that does not happen, by the time the 20 years end, for you to get a ruling, you are dead. 
Now it is your children or your wife. All these things did not happen in our traditional courts. That's number one. Now look at the elections in Uganda. Let's talk about Uganda alone. I don't know if they have heard how much money the Electoral Commission has asked for. I'm talking about only one entity now, Electoral Commission. I have not talked about judiciary. I have not talked about security and police. Mm -mm. I have not talked about them. I have not talked about how much money each MP, each Chairman 5 will have to put across to organize an election. No, I'm talking about one entity called Electoral Commission. You know the billions of money they have asked for to organize an election. That never happened. That never used to happen. If Professor Alenio had stood for leadership in the village with the Honorable Dongoto, Alenio and Dongoto would stand. One the other one, one this side and the other one here, parallel. They look there. If you support Professor Alenio, you stand behind him. We count one, two, three, four. There is no cheating. No. People standing behind Professor Alenio, they don't need any computer, any machine to count them. We can count them. So we would leave the day in two hours, we have finished the election in the community, and we know our leader. What is happening today? Let's go to Germany, hire a, 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 a farm, give them billions of money to print for you ballot papers. Who is managing the election? You are simply here casting the vote. The system that is managing the election is somebody's business. That's how they've manipulated us. That's how they've told us. Now even here we, we should go uh, e-election. E Come and tick and go, then the system will count. You know? So it's no longer even going to be this ballot paper ticking. No, you come and put your thumb, the system will... Who is managing that system? Who manufactures that system? That's not an African. That's not Uganda. That's a business. And so, they know that from that, there is going to be a conflict. From that. So you begin fighting right from the day of the voting. You go to court, that is money. You continue fighting for them, they are earning. Another election cycle, five, after, uh, five years after five years, that is how Africans have been subjected into that kind of cycle of fighting. So we are asking, this is the parliament, shouldn't Africa return to their norms and traditions and cultures of electing their own leadership? Let us wait. Let us see. If we go back to our ways, vis-a-vis -vis the hybrid democracy, I'm calling it democracy, because even the one who chooses for you, a leader is not you, he's not even seated here with you. So it's a hybrid. So why can't we discuss whether or not we should actually go back to our traditional ways of living, right from choosing the leaders at, 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 at every level. And that's why I'm asking African, um, 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 that's the question. African traditional and judicial system versus Western commercialized democracy. Which way Africa? Which way should Africa take? Should we continue with this commercialized, very expensive and democratic process? Or we should go back to our ways that we used to actually elect among us ourselves. Free your mind now. Be part of People's Pan-African Parliament, the Pan-African Pyramid Debate, with your speaker, Andrew Irumba Katushabe. Um, this is a very detailed topic mm. because it combines, I don't know, speaker, two aspects of matters that affect our community. Mm. The first aspect is the judicial system. Mm. The second aspect is the political system, mm. democracy. Mm. And right honorable speaker, it is a very interesting topic to discuss at this moment when in our country and on our continent these questions are being asked. If you have been keen 
in following world events, then you have all noticed that democracy has ended. If you have been observant, you know that world over democracy has ended. You also know that world over justice is at stake. And when we want to know better, we use the, we use the yardsticks. We use the yardsticks of the USA, what is happening in the USA, what is happening in Europe, and then we come home, what is happening in Africa. Indeed, right, Honorable Speaker, someone recently commented, I think it is a, a musician in USA, 50 cents, he commented and said, the world is actually coming to an end, according to him, having seen the politics, the economics, and the judicial system. So, right, Honorable Speaker, these are very interesting times on our African continent. I wanted first to, dis to define, before I set off the discussion, what is democracy? I'm going to center my discussion on the political part, and I think another person will handle the judicial part of African judicial system. I'm going to concentrate heavily on the political aspect. What is democracy? Democracy is said to be a system of leadership for the people, by the people, and with the people. Not so? That one we all know. And we all know that democracy is a system that started in Greece, in Athens. But it was adopted then by the entire Western world, adopting what we call and what they call democracy. But democracy is essentially evil. It is essentially evil. Democracy was invented 2,400 years ago. But when it was invented, a Greek philosopher, Socrates, also predicted its end. And I think for those of you who have been active on the internet, you have seen the predictions of Socrates on democracy. Have you seen it? Right on the speaker, democracy, when it was first founded, was introduced in the city of Athens by a person. And that person, who introduced democracy had a name. He was called Celestines. I think you have seen that. Celestines wanted to have a democratic system where people would elect their own leaders. This is as opposed to things as they were. Things as they were, they were monarchical. There were monarchies, leaders were chosen by the monarchical system, by kingship, and by God. So, even from the onset, the principle of democracy being a government of the people, by the people, in themselves, as opposed to what God has said, was inherently evil. We now see, like in the US, democracy has been hijacked by homosexuals. Why? Because democracy, meaning demos, talks about population. If the entire population says this is right, then it becomes right. If the entire population says this is wrong, then it becomes wrong. Not because it is wrong, but because the population says it is wrong. Oh. Now, at the time democracy was being introduced in the world, also in the Holy Land, in Israel, people were demanding to elect their own king. At the same time, here democracy was being introduced in Athens, in the Holy Land, 
people were demanding to elect their leader. Read the, in the, the Bible, Jeremiah chapter 6, verses 16 to 20. Also there, the end of democracy was predicted by the Bible. Now, Mr. Speaker, if I read to you the predictions of secretism on democracy, mm. you would think that he was in the Ugandan parliament as he was predicting. Mm. Hey. Because, right honorable speaker, I want to tell you what Socrates said. He said, this is 2,300 years ago. Two Socrates, 2,300 years ago, mm. Socrates said, democracy must fail because it will try to satisfy everyone, to try to tailor everyone. Mm. The poor will want the wealth of the rich and democracy will give it to them. Mm. So Chris also said, democracy will fail because young people will demand entitlements of the old. Mm. He also said, democracy will fail because women will want to be treated like men. He also said, democracy will fail because foreigners will take over the rights of the natives. He then finally said that democracy will fail. Right, Honorable Speaker, this is very important. Mm. He said democracy will fail mm. when thieves and fraudsters will want to take important functions and offices in government. Mm -hmm. And democracy will give it to them. That's why, that's why you said it. That that he was talking about Uganda. Yes. And that is where he ended his prediction. And that is where democracy has reached now. Thieves and fraudsters have taken authority, not only in Uganda, in the parliament, but all over Africa. Mm. Right, Honorable Speaker, there is a video circulating mm. about Ghana, the situation in Ghana, mm. where people are calling for another type of governance, mm. at least not democracy, because it is full of corruption, vote buying, and opulence of parliamentarians, just like here. And that's why you see that this year in particular, mm. democracy has failed everywhere. In South Africa, the African National Congress, which used to dominate the South African parliament, has lost its majority for the first time. People have started seeing beyond democracy and parties. In India, the PGP party has also lost its clout. In Ghana, if you have not read the speech of the outgoing president, Manhattan, then you are, you are not an African. In Uganda here, surely, how many of you can say that we have what we call political parties? Which political party do we have in place? NRM. No? Nope. NRM. No? Nope. NRM. As new as NOOP is, wasn't the leader of opposition from NOOP? Didn't he participate? in the false leadership award. NRM, the service award. Yes. The new person participated. NRM. Why did you want to start with NRM, right, honorable speaker? Because they're in power. <laughs> that one, <laughs> that one, looking, that one you need them. to listen to the speech of the outgoing president of Ghana. He said, the rule, when the ruling party lost in Ghana, he said, in Africa, the gap between ruling parties and the people is widening. The elites are fighting among themselves. They have sold the party. DP. <laughs> Someone sold it off and even went to NRM. UPC, the person sold it off, his wife is a minister there, he's here. So is there any political party in Uganda? No. Democrats are safe. Right, Honorable Speaker, we have to try to go back to African leadership styles, not this multi-party Western democracy. These political parties are like football clubs. Chelsea, Manchester United. Me, I don't follow football. Because I see it is a game. Right, Honorable Speaker, it is time that we went back 
we went back to the, the crossroads. It's time we went back to a balanced African style democracy. And speaking of Uganda, right honorable speaker, this thing had been done. In 1986, what I consider the best thing happened in Uganda. I think as Ugandans, what happened in 1986 was the best thing to us. A certain person came to power, president, but he came with a quasi-African system. He did not come with multi-party democracy of the Western world. No. You are very well aware that when NRM came to power, there were no political parties allowed. No multi-partism. And the best thing that happened to Uganda that time, from 1986 to 1996, for a whole decade, we did not have Western-style democracy. And Uganda developed best at that time. Then 1996, politics set in. Elections. That's where M7 began to lose ground. And then Adam began to lose ground. All the subsequent elections began to become worse. Until 2005, we had a referendum that we should go back to multi-party democracy, which meant that we left our African-grown individual merit system. So the 26 elections, multi-party democracy became bad. Since then, elections have been worsening until where we have reached now. And as Socrates, the philosopher, predicted 2036 years, we now have thieves and fraudsters. Go to any street of Uganda, people are dejected with the fraudsters in parliament. What is the way forward? The way forward is that we should get back. We should get back to a a partial, quasi-African valued electoral system. Partial, quasi. Uh, yes. Some, you, I mean, we bring in elements of African. Oh. Yes. Ancient we, we may not go full grown for now. Yes. We introduce slowly, slowly. Yes. We may not full go full grown because of uh, the following reasons, board, right, mm. right, Honorable Speaker. We cannot go back to the ancient African monarchies. Mm. Why? Because they had their, their loopholes. They had their inadequacies as African monarchs. Mm. So we have to balance. And I'm saying in 1986, the LC system that was brought had a very, very balanced system. Talk of judiciary. I tell you, when I was in Minister of Justice, one of the best things we expected was that the judicial powers of the T system was to be ah, man. En enhanced. We are supposed the LC system, right, Honorable Speaker, answered all your queries. The LC system, your Honorable Speaker, answered all your queries on the judicial process. One, the LC sitting in the LC1 court knew the people very well. And because they are locals, natives in that village, they would not take bribe. Because if they took a bribe on a small case, they would remain as natives in the village. This bribe would never leave them. The LC system, if it is enforced, would be the best judicial system. But the elite began to overpower President Nsef. They destroyed the LC1 system. The LC1 courts were destroyed. Powers were removed from them. Powers over land were removed. Powers over land cases were removed. Powers even over criminal cases were removed. And yet, in my opinion, the LC1 court can even try crime. Why not? If someone is killed in the village, while the case is still fresh in everybody's mind, people know who was killed, people know who was drinking with the dead man, how the quarrel started, all the witnesses are there. They could hear this case. But now, President Museveni gave in to elitism and Western democracy. They said, no, else is don't have power to hear capital because that's too big for them. Now, what happens when the person is killed in the village? The case is, had, is taken to court and the person is committed to high court and the case is had over four years later when witnesses have died, 
it will be had in the high courts, maybe in the Navy. And the villagers who know the, the, the case, the witnesses, they will not even come because they are, there's no money. Land cases like yours. The case, instead of being handled by people who know the land, who know the witnesses, is brought to the high court. In the high court, it is before a person who does not know Chen George. He will need to, to, to organize this session after five years. After five years, they will know they would have killed your father, they would have killed witness A, they would have eaten money. Right Honorable Speaker, finally, mm. I want to say this. Democracy, in my opinion, has ended. Any country that is trying to force this democracy of multipartism on its citizens, it's going to knock. Free your mind now. Be part of People's Pan-African Parliament, the Pan-African Pyramid Debate with your speaker, Andrew Irumba Katushabe. So this is an Afrocentric, Eurocentric pers perspective. Right. Europeans' justice system has been founded on four categories of philosophers in Europe. There are four categories of philosophers that founded the justice system the white man believes in. We have the ancient philosophers, the ancient Greek philosophers that Professor talked about, that includes Plato and Aristotle. Then we have the medieval Christian philosophers like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, some of you here who spend the whole night praying that you are going to heaven, I hope you are aware that there are non-Christian saints that have been ordained by the Catholic Church. And non, they're in heaven. Non-Christian non -Christian saints. They are See. not Christians, but they are saints. And they are in heaven. And they have been ordained by, be... the, by the church? Yes, by, by, by the Catholic Church. How does that happen? Yeah, it, it's a clear indicator that for you to receive the kingdom of God is not a religion. Religion is a vehicle. Yes. The most important thing is how you get there, doing good to humanity. So we have medieval Christian philosophers that shaped the European perspective of justice system. Then we have modern philosophers that emerged after the medieval philosophers like Thomas Hobbes and Hume. These are the third generation of philosophers that emerged from the Greek time. Then now we have recent philosophers. Recent philosophers. By recent, I don't mean last week. I mean 200 years ago. People like Kant and Mill. If you go to Europe, you go and visit their symmetry. And then we have contemporary philosophers. I have placed myself in the category of African contemporary philosophers. So okay. these ancient Greek philosophers, the medieval Christian philosophers, the modern political philosophers like Hobbes, the recent political philosophers like Mill, and the contemporary political philosophers shaped what you call justice from the European perspective. Now, what is justice? One author called Meise in 2003 Define what justice is, because we need to know what we are talking about. We can say someone is unjust, but what is justice? Is justice just? Is now, justice, we have, is justice. justice just? Because justice can be unjust. For example, in Buganda here, you used to have the death sentence. People who opposed the Kabaka were executed. They would tie a stone on your neck and throw you into Lake Victoria. Even the Uganda martyrs were executed for treason. I don't know how it becomes a religious thing. That is justice to them, but is it just? No. So it's justice, just. So there are four kinds of justice in the world. Mm -hmm. So before you talk about justice, you should ask yourself, which kind of justice are you talking about? Mm -hmm. We have distributive justice, we have restorative justice, we have procedural justice, and we have retributive justice. Mm -hmm. Now, the justice system in Europe was founded on two principles on two principles. One, that there is a sovereign state. The state, the government must be everywhere. There has to be a sovereign authority. The numbers of cows in the U.S. in Texas have been there. It's more than all the number of cows in Uganda combined, but you don't find cattle rustling in Texas. Because there is a sovereign state. The government will get you. But in Africa, we don't have a sovereign state, and we need to have a justice kind of system. So Europe was, justice system in Europe was founded on the basis that one, there is a sovereign state. Two, it was founded to protect property and individual rights. 
The law in Europe is not for the ordinary man. It's to protect the property and rights of the rich people. Mm. That is their construction of the law. But is it just? And that's the question I'm coming to. And the justice system was found on capitalism. I have my wall fence, I have my cow, I have my gold. If you steal it, they do what they call retributive justice. They punish you, they lock you in prison for stealing something of a rich man. The law was to protect private wealth. Now, when they came to Africa, this white man did a very bad thing that we may not correct in our lifetime. They informed we had ethnic states. There are four concepts. Africa were ethnicities on their own. When I tried to write a PhD proposal on ethnicity, all the professors in Europe could not understand what ethnicity is. It doesn't make sense to them. They don't understand ethnicity. So when the white man came to the African continent, they found so many ethnic groups. What is ethnicity? Any group with a similar race, similar culture, in a geographic location, with a language, with a dialect, with a religion, with economic and social position, qualifies to be an ethnic, ethnicity. So when the white man came to Africa, four things had to be considered. One was like Uganda, where we a state or a nation state. State. Two, where are we a state? Is Uganda a state or a nation state? Or are we a multinational state? Now, the prescription the white man brought to Africa about their justice system was where they expected Africa to have a state, and yet we are a multinational state. Ajuli is a state. Buganda is a state. Toro is a state. Kigezi is a state. We are several states Angola within is a state. one. Angola is a state. We are several states within one nation. So we qualify to be a multinational state. And the white man brings a justice system of a sovereign state and not of a multinational state. So mm. when the colonialists came to the African continent, they imposed the nation state. If I may quote one great. Pan African is called Idowa William. Idowa William? Yes. He said, I quote, Africa is yet to shade off its character as an illegitimate child of colonialism. They combined us together. 52 different ethnic groups put together to form one country called Uganda. How can you not have problems? Eight years ago, I used to take alcohol. When you go in a bar with a white man, when they are drunk, they start guessing that maybe they are the same tribe of, of William Shakespeare. The white man destroyed the state. They destroyed the tribe and ethnicity completely and deliberately. No one can even say, I'm from the clan of William Shakespeare. But when you are in Africa, like in Uganda, I get arrested, I end up to the police station. There is still a form that asks for my tribe. Yes. Even in the National Referral Hospital, they still want to know my tribe. Why? If we are the same country. The post-colonial states confrontation, there was a confrontation between strong ethnicities, weak et 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 ethnicities, and divided ethnicities. That is why the British, in their wisdom, brought indirect rule. Because there was no sovereign authority in Africa. So they had to use the existing authority to extend their administration in different parts of the world. And Professor Mamdani, if I may quote him, he said, European colonizers strengthen tribal chiefs because they met a situation where in a small country that it takes 30 minutes to fly over in an air bus, there are 52 tribes. And for your information, we are different. We are different because we took over 2,000 years it took me over 2,000 years to evolve to be what I am, and actually, it took another 2,000 years or 3,000 to evolve to be a Mutoro. We are different, but we have now been put together. In Uganda, there is a word called patriotism, which I have deleted from all my dictionaries. Why? Why? Because it is, it is trying to tell you to shade off your ethnic identity and be Ugandan. So you shade it off and be Ugandan, and yet other people have not shaded it. It is foolery. 
So we must recognize that we are different ethnicities in one country to the extent that the Nigerians have done it. If they are appointing electoral commission, every ethnicity should be represented. If not, there is no commission. The same in India. But in Uganda, because they want you to blindly follow patriotism, they end up appointing only one tribe because they are competent. But we have 57 different tribes, for God's sake. And it's very unlikely that even in 2,000 years, there will be intermarriage and everyone will be one. The nation states, the multinational state, is not evolving into a nation state. Obote one government did a very good thing. There was cross-educational exchange. It yes. was a deliberate effort. Yes. People from Ankole studied in Samuel Becker. My father studied in St. Leo's Fort Portal. Deliberately, his OB is Minister Tom Butime. The last time I went there in Fort Portal, I had to walk in the evening to see maybe there's someone who looks like me there. I could be having a brother <laughs> and knowing. It was a deliberate effort by the pre-colonial government that in 50 years, there would be intermarriage and then the multinational state would come into being a, a state. Mm. But capitalism has undone all that. You can study from Nasser to university in your village and you get a degree without even visiting other parts of the country. Mm. Now, the African traditional system on the first part. The African justice system is restorative. It is not retributive. We restore the individual and bring the individual back to the society. Before the United Nations was formed, before immediately after the, the League of Nations was formed, and then the United Nations was formed, then they brought international conventions on prisoners of war. My tribe, there was no death sentence. We knew how to handle prisoners of war even before the League of Nations had put anything in writing. I think the white man even borrowed it. Mato put. Yes, we have alternative justice system. Mato put. The justice system in Africa is restorative. We can take three examples. The Ubuntu system in, 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 in South Africa. The Gachacha courts in Rwanda. The Matoput in Acholi. I wanted to do a PhD in Matoput, but I realized some white men from Sweden had done extensive work in that area that there was no new area for anyone to do research on. They come and borrow everything. I was shocked. I was reading about my Matoput <laughs> in a Swedish journal and properly written. Hey. So for, for the justice system in Africa to work, we must think of a restorative justice system. We should not think of a retributive justice system. That is why the African prisons are full. I was doing a quick research. If you compare the prisons in Europe and in Africa, 97, 79% of those in prison are those waiting for trial, not even those who are convicted. So what is the importance of having the presumption of innocence until proven guilty? You are talking about in Africa. Specifically in Uganda, in the Uganda. prisons are full because we have a justice system which does not work. 76, I repeat them, 76 percent. 76 percent of those in Ugandan prisons are those waiting for trial. Not even those who are convicted. And that is what we call justice. Ah. At times I feel bad even calling myself a lawyer. Mm. We stay in court, we put on expensive ties, and we talk a language that the accused is not even understanding what is going on. Just playing with the furniture like this. They are using the, Yes, it's in the dark. <laughs> Men's rare, actors rare, wow, My lord, and my lord. And we are trying a person in a language the person does not even understand. That is why at times we get humiliated. Justice Kanyamba went to an LC1 court. We gave them powers to adjudicate issues of land. And when he was in the court, this one he told us in the committee of parliament. Mm. He raised an objection. Look, those of you who are talking of the LC systems, we need to be very careful. Mm. We need to be very careful. Those people in the villages are monsters. They have no shame. <laughs> Justice Kanyama raised a PO that be, Mr. Chairman, before we begin this case. PO, for, for the for the people for to understand, PO means preliminary, preliminary objection. objection. That before we begin the case, yes. I have some issues. Preliminary objection. Attention. So you need to understand the yes. audience. He yeah. had a land dispute with a neighbor, an old judge of the Supreme Court, but he had to go before the LC1. 
And he said, Mr. Chairman, the person you are you are chairing, I am competing with Overland, is your relative. You must disqualify yourself from this case and let your vice chair. And you know what the LC1 said? That if I don't stand for my relative, who else will? <laughs> so we have to be very cautious when we talk of the traditional African justice system. The traditional African justice system, there was no fair trial. We allowed the kings to be the prosecutor, to be the defense, the defense lawyer, and to be the executor. Very many people lost their lives because of kings, and that is even how the Ugandan, the Ugandan martyrs were killed, because they were saying there's another god who is more important than the Kabaka. There's another king. They say, these people, we have to deal with them. They're going to cause a problem in your kingdom. And I'm very glad on the third, you went there, celebrating the religious life of those who are killed for political reasons. Divided loyalty. Now, <laughs> it's divided loyalty. In 300 years, loyalty should have been to the Kabak. In fact, the entire religion of Christianity is founded on divide, divided loyalty. Look at the life of Jesus Christ, a very controversial individual who was killed in 33 years. Hey. You go to a big temple and say, I will throw this down and build it in three days. Something that was put in 40 years. You think the government will leave you? <laughs> it's a dangerous man. What can you say such a thing? They were seeing with naked eyes, but Jesus was talking about life after here. Now, let me get to the second part of my presentation, which I will just read. Democracy. There is one author called Fukuyama. Fukuyama says, democracy is the final form of human government, that there is nothing else that will ever come after democracy. This is very interesting. So my last prescription is that the white man will never accept Africa to develop. Mm. I lived with them for three years constantly and I've become skeptic. For example, all these movies you see from Hollywood, they are being censored by the U.S. government to brand the U.S. as a very rich country and a very wealthy country. Everyone would want to go to Hollywood and pick money from dustbins. But when you are in the U.S., you will see the face of poverty, the cold weather, and then you realize we are more richer than them. But because they have worked on your mind, if you go and apply for a U.S. visa, the next date for the interview they'll give you is 2029. This money is they're donating to your government. They are collecting it through visa fees. Every day, the U.S. Embassy here collects up to about 6 billion shillings money from you because you want to go to America. And their systems are programmed that they only allow 2%. So the issue is, why do you collect my money if you don't know you are going to give me the visa? You and must have a system of determining that you're not going to give me the visa so that I don't pay. I should pay at the point when I've been admitted. Yes. Precisely. Yes. So this is fraud. So that is this fraud. This is even worse than... And then tomorrow they're saying they're fighting corruption. They're yes. sanctioning so and so. Yes. It's this worse than slave trade. Thing. What they're doing here in Zambia is worse than slave trade. Because at least slavery, you carry one elephant task from, Mas <laughs> from Zanzibar to Muscat and they release you. They give you an option of becoming a domestic servant. But this one, every day, people wake up at 4 a.m., they are now lining up at the American Embassy. Out of 1,000 people, they give six. And but all of you have paid people. money. All I, of you have paid. Yes. I have the statistics, if you can check on my YouTube channel. Mm. I have the exact amount of money collected in visa fees. It is almost 30% of the GDP of Uganda. Honorable <laughs> Dongozo, yes. stop lying. In visa fees. I did my research. Are you lying? These are facts. The money collected by the U.S. and foreign embassies in visa fees is 30% of our budget. You prefer to give it to the Americans. You don't want to give it to your government because you don't want a freeze. So it's a complex matter. Let me stop at this phase here. Thank you so much. Free your mind now. Be part of People's Pan-African Parliament, the Pan-African Pyramid Debate with your speaker, Andrew Irumba Katushabe. Mr. Chair, we are aware very much that the African system of justice were specifically handled by leaders who would take decisions 
and as such, their participation and proceedings would shape a way forward towards the justice system. And that would aim specifically at reconciliation and probably maintaining harmony. Now, how, how, how was the justice system in traditional setting administered? We have seen issues of uh, local courts, that uh, uh, through local courts, that were made up of influential leaders, generally we could call them maybe opinion leaders, and uh, specifically incorporating those like chiefs, uh, clan leaders, and the elders. There was uh, a lot of dictatorship as far as incorporating the young people in the decision-making process. Because for you to qualify to be a local leader, to administer justice, you must be someone of a certain age. Mm. Now, the African traditional justice system in contemporary legal dispensation generally defeats the legal pluralism in the modern uh, African democracy. Because we are looking at, when you look at the formal justice system, it is quite expensive for you to exhaust the legal procedures. At a, it involves a, a lot of gymnastic, uh, uh, the gymnastics of the law. It's quite difficult to understand. Mr. Chair, I will give you an example which Honorable uh, put it very clearly. If you, someone wants to prove the burden, right? burden of not guilty, proving mm. that someone is not guilty, mm. if someone has the presumption of innocence, Mm. Now, you know very well that in Uganda, it is the, you, you are proved innocent, you are presumed innocent until proven guilty. Mm. But there are some countries where you are proven guilty before uh, until you, you say, you, no, if, I, if the suspect that in, in Rwanda, you are guilty until you prove yourself innocent. So now, that is where the issue of becoming expensive comes in. Because of uh, uh, because commercialization. We will now the, the commercialization of, 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 of the judicial system. First of all, you have to put a lot of money mm. to prove that that person is a, you know, uh, is, a, is a guilty. Mm. Because I will give you an example. That uh, a murderer who is caught red-handed, killing, mm. We will first he, of all, he's innocent. We will first of all be subjected to a comfort zone because of the application of the law will entail the human rights aspect. This person again, you will see him now, no issues of human rights, the right to fair hearing. But this is the person who has the right. He has killed the right to uh, to medical, the yes. right to adequate food, you know. And the adequate food involves even the quality and the quantity. The, the, the right the to adequate food, the, the right, right to medical to care. You, he's in prison, but he has the right to adequate food. Not only adequate, but involves the quality and the quantity. You don't just give him a portion and the pizza and stop there. No. Please give him omelette in the morning. Tell me one prison that has ever served any good day. This is what I am telling you, the right to adequate food. Although in Uganda there is a short supply. <laughs> when we look at it in terms of law. So that means he should not be even subjected to a human treatment. Mm. The right to life. You see? So the right to a lawyer. But this is a man that who has killed. Yeah, and then they, they say, could be telling lies about him. You see, they say now you see, 
uh, we need to have a postmortem report to prove whether it was a bullet or not. Maybe something that resembles a bullet could have hit him. And so they, they even went, now you can see how commercialized it is. You put a lot of money to go to, to the doctor to prove through postmortem whether it was a bullet or not. Now, and when it is proven so, when it is proven guilty, He's even sentenced. He, he does not also face the issue of life, I mean, a death penalty, because death penalty is not there. Now, if he's proven guilty, he's simply sentenced to, to life imprisonment. Can you imagine? Now, life is imprisonment. Government now spends more money to feed him in the prison. A person who has a kill, my government is spending more money to feed this person in prison because he has been convicted. So I, I, as, as you wind up, I want to understand your argument. I, I want to understand your argument. Do you agree that this kind of democracy is expensive? I put it in, in my introductory part. I said it is a deficit. So, so that means that in the African traditional setting, at a certain time, you know, they were dealing, they were applying the Hammurabi's principle, the philosophy, mm -hmm. a tooth for a tooth. Hey. An eye for an eye. For an eye. If you cut my ear, I cut your ear. I, I cut your ear. Mm -hmm. But again, it had legal discrepancies. There were some of these uh, differences in application. Mm -hmm. Because I will give you an example. For instance, if an offender rapes a six month baby, uh -huh. What do you do if you apply a privacy <laughs> principle? What do you do if you uh, are afraid that rapes a six month baby? What death, do you do? Death penalty. No, but because we are saying that Hamura is a tooth for a tooth. Hey, hey, you look for, uh -huh. now, hey, you should also look for you as a six month. Now you look for the six month baby of uh, an offender. What if the offender doesn't have a six month baby? Yes, <laughs> the last point is 30 years. What did you do? <laughs> so there are issues in there, there are some university issues. So in, 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 in doing uh, the comparative analysis of the judicial review systems among the traditional justice system, uh, respect and protection of fundamental freedoms and, uh, and uh, fundamental freedoms were not, it was not followed. That's why someone sits somewhere put on a, a, a skin of a leopard and orders for the killing of Uganda matters. She said, someone from somewhere sits in his room somewhere because he has put on a, 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 a skin of a leopard. He's looking uh, uh, as if a leopard. Then he just orders, please, Uganda matters be killed. She said, so that is where we have uh, issues, which is contrary to the human rights treaties. And uh, of course, uh, now, in the conclusion, Mr. Chair, we are looking at now which way forward for Africa. Mm. Africa, as we talk now, we need to incorporate both the traditional justice system and the modern democratic justice system based on the civil and the common law. Mm. Because the common law, the, 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 the civil law, will handle issues of legislation. Mm. And legislation, it's very, very paramount in terms of uh, analyzing the legal regime mm. in our country. Mm. Now, the common law or the case law, law is specifically uh, those judicial uh, decisions mm. and, uh, and customs rather than those in the statutes and in the, in the, in the, in the constitution. Thank Mr. you, Comrade. Mm. As I conclude, mm. the democratic tenets are very, very clear. There are some countries, because there's a, one of my colleagues, speaker, I think when I want to say that it's not democracy, I, I think in, the, in, the, in, the, in Africa, in most of the African countries. But I want to state that, yes, yeah, we have adopted Western democratic tenets. It may not be 100%, but at least we are there. Because the tenets of democracy that we have here are solid. We have periodic elections. We have a democratic speech. You know, the owner of been speaking here, one time I mean, asked, was asked the question that, do you have freedom of speech in your country? 
He said, yes, there's a freedom of speech. But the freedom of the speech, I can't guarantee. <laughs> so, uh, where, 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 that there are some countries in Africa which has a short supply of democracy. There are countries that have been taking power through who? Mm. Who did us? Through military rule, through the, the, the gunpowder. Thank you. And all of that, I think where we are, we, it is not proper for us to say there is totally no democracy at all. There Thank could you. be certain democracy, but a certain percentage. So we need to look at what percentage, which is a democratic country in Africa, Ghana. What percentage? Maybe eighty percent. What about you can maybe seventy percent or sixty or whatever figure? But we can't say totally there is nothing. Just Free your mind now. Be part of People's Pan-African Parliament, the Pan-African Pyramid Debate with your speaker, Andrew Irumba Katushabe. I want to make my presentation in three steps. First, to make a logical and yet realistic comparison of the African traditional and judicial system and then the Western commercialized, uh, commercialized democracy. Secondly, to suggest possible solutions and thirdly, to harmonize three concepts as regards democracy. First, the African traditional and judicial systems have been the backbone of our social, political, and economic fabric for centuries. What we are talking about is systems that are deep-rooted in our cultural heritage, in our values, and in our beliefs, and how powerfully they emphasize the concept of building consensus, restorative justice, reconciliation, resilience, and adaptability. Now, looking at the other, at the other end is Western commercialized, commercialized democracy that has been first-hand imposed on Africa. Secondly, that proclaims the rule of the majority over the minority but yet works for the minority to degrade, oppress, rob the majority. Mm. I want to tell you colleagues that, that the concept of Western commercialized democracy is doctored, prefabricated, and galvanized with its focus on signs and symptoms rather than the reality. The Honorable O.O. being a lawyer must know that around equity lies the principle of substance over form. And now you have a democracy that is interested in the form rather than the substance. You think to have a democracy is to have timely elections without discussing the form. An election where civilians are beaten, killed, embarrassed, and lots of things happen. But because there has been an election, it is categorized as democracy, not looking at the form. I, at this very moment, want to disagree with, uh, with the Professor Alenio. The idea of democracy, in my opinion, is not bad. What is bad is the kind of democracy that we copy. Oh. I associate my thinking and resonate with, with, uh, Council, with Council O.O. when he says that what Africa needs is alternative democracy that suits and fits our context. I am a young Pan-African that is under the mentorship of our dear speaker. And one of the things I have learned is to distinguish two types of Pan-Africanism. Ancient Pan-Africanism that was built on racism, hatred, and anger, and the modern Pan-Africanism that appreciates reality and is going towards the direction of engineering solutions. Which way does Africa take? I would propose a hybrid approach that integrates the strength of these two systems. Secondly, we need to have a revitalization and a modernization of our African traditional and judicial systems. But the young people of Africa must also continue to reshape the narrative so that we own our destiny and contextualize democracy to fit our needs and aspirations. Lastly, harmonizing three concepts around democracy. One is a hegemony, two is agonism, 
And the third one is a dosas, a dosatic paradigmatic. Regional speaker, I will break it down. Mm. The concept of hegemony means that there is dominance of one class or group that critiques democratic systems while masking underlying power imbalances. That a certain group or a certain corner of the world, now groups which country is democratic and which one is not. What occurrences are okay and which ones are not okay? And that we must wipe out. We must, uh, we must wipe out. The second is agonism. Agonism is a philosophical approach that views demo democracy more as a space for constructive conflict or debate rather than as a quest for consensus. Now, agonism misleads the entire operation of democracy. Thirdly and lastly is a dosastic paradigmatic. This is a study That's of right. how of how public opinion mm. and belief shape democratic decision making and policy paradigms. Conclusively, if the three formation concepts do not align, mm. then the kind of democracy is contradictory and you should throw it away. I beg to submit. Free your mind now. Be part of People's Pan-African Parliament, the Pan-African Pyramid Debate with your speaker, Andrew Irumba Katushabe. If we as Africans, by then in 1800s, 900s, as Africa, we had systems whereby we were ruled and controlled by the traditional leaders, by the kings, by the chiefs, we didn't have issues related to political affairs or policies. We have presidential presidents, maybe in the cabinet. We didn't have such systems as we Africans. Okay. But what beats my mind, as the Europeans, for example, England, they maintain their system of the monarchy system, and they came to Africa, whereby they diminishing our traditional systems to bring their what? Traditional, uh, they are... Westernized the system. Exactly, westernized system. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that, in that context, if you look at that nature point that I'm trying to put across, mm -hmm. why are they doing that? Is it that if we as Africans, our African leader rules for over 40 years, maybe 50 years, a king. You mean for us we cannot be ahead, we can't put a step ahead? Why are they impoverishing our systems as Europeans? Okay, that's food for thought. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Free your mind now. Be part of People's Pan-African Parliament, the Pan-African Pyramid Debate with your speaker, Andrew Irumba Katushabe. That Africa need to have a unique path that will balance the strength of all systems for our inclusive, equity, and justice, so and justice society. So allow me to end here. Free your mind now. Be part of People's Pan-African Parliament, the Pan-African Pyramid Debate with your speaker, Andrew Irumba Katushabe. I'll finish the debate. Good night. Free your mind now. Be part of People's Pan-African Parliament, the Pan-African Pyramid Debate with your speaker, Andrew Irumba Katushabe.